Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. Let's all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Under roll call, we'll note that we have uh, all board members here tonight. Moving to executive session announcements, uh, I'd like to announce that we will be holding an executive session immediately following tonight's board meeting to discuss potential litigation. And I do not have any public comments, but before we move forward, uh, does anybody wish to make public comment at this time? I saw a hand. Come on up. You can sit at the mic there. There we go. Hi. My name is Jenny Donovan, and I've been a community member at Potts Grove since 1981. All four of my children have graduated from Potts Grove. Uh, I come before you to this evening um, for Relief for Life of Pottstown. Um, I've been a team captain for 30, uh, 20 years, all 20 relays starting at the Hill School. And I understand recently, uh, the first in August, there was discussion about our relay and the American Cancer Society, and it was also brought up again in January. So I come before you asking, um, I believe Mrs. Grimm was the one who had suggested a subcommittee uh, meeting with the relay folks and also the American Cancer Society. So I have two questions that I pose for you. Um, has a subcommittee been uh, put together and um, when can we meet? Because the more we find out your concerns and your questions um, and we come together, that's how we're all gonna learn what the relay is, what the American Cancer Society is. So I'm wondering if anyone can answer those two questions so we can move forward and educate each other. Actually, actually sure. Jenny, I'm glad you came. Um, Thank you. But I didn't request the subcommittee. Oh, you didn't? Okay. No, no, okay. because I'm 100% for it, and everybody here knows that. Thank so you. I'll do whatever I can to okay. keep it here. So okay. Yeah, just so you know. But I don't think there's been a subcommittee or anything there's some suggestions, I think. So how, how so, can we move forward on it? Um, because I'll be honest, it's something that um, I believe very strongly in. Um, my family has been involved, my, my personal family has been involved since 1965 when my grandmother had cancer and the American Cancer Society helped her. Um, at this particular moment, the American Cancer Society is also helping my sister I have a 52-year-old sister who has brain cancer and stage four lung cancer. Um, one lung is completely gone to cancer. And um, I fully believe in the relay and the American Cancer Society. And I really um, would like to see Potts Grove embrace this wonderful organization. Um, so if we could have some sort of a committee that we can meet privately um, and come together so that we answer your questions, and you can answer our questions, you know, that maybe we would have. So I'll just, I could give you a quick update sure. on where we are. Sure. Yes, uh, to answer your question, um, we actually hadn't com considered a subcommittee only by the fact that I, th I thought that the f it would be a full board involvement. Just okay, because I must have misread that then in the Mercury. Uh, well. <laughs> We, we did so talk about we did talk about a subcommittee, but okay. what the plan was, and we have been in contact uh, with people from uh, the American Cancer Society. Yes, I'm aware that last we reached out to you asking, right. and we were told that it was a budget committee. Right, we meeting. had a budget presentation. Right. It was going to be a long meeting. So what okay. we asked was, and and just to be clear, sure. everything is safe for this year, and and and. and oh, I'm not concerned you know, about this year. I mean. I do, there, I'm, there were I'm just some questions of, raised, right. and I think it's you know it's everybody's sure. right to ask the questions, and you I think it's great that they're that. willing to come right. out and exactly. and help people to understand. Right. So we do have 
it in the plan that sometime in the in the as the the budget season wears down and we okay. start to hammer that out okay um that we'll have somebody come in and or some bodies come in okay and and have at, have them answer questions and okay. absolutely if they have questions and sure and we'll be happy to and, and let me ask you just a time frame what um when does budget really calm down <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, okay. Because well, I would say we'll we'll be doing the plan would be to do it in the spring, far before the end of the school well, year. Well, because I I've been yeah. like I said twenty years doing this, so I've sat on our board, um, as I sat on many boards here at Potts Grove during my time, and um, I know that we're always brought up about July August for approval for the following year. Correct. So I don't want to see it go to that. I think um, what I've learned in life. And in, through my involvement at Potts Grove, the more knowledge that you have early, not presenting it in a meeting and then you voting, it's better to have it and then think it through, bef have that month, and then vote on it. Um, you know, when you do things so quickly, sometimes you miss things. Sometimes we don't hear things, um, quite frankly. So I would ask that you would give us plenty of time to be able to present things. Um, I guess I misunderstood. I thought we were having a smaller atmosphere, not a, a big board meeting for the two sides coming together. It may not be a board meeting. It might just okay. be a workshop. Okay, but that's fine. But I, I think just because so many people ask questions and, sure. and we, all ha we all definitely have strong opinions. Sure. Uh, some of us may be still be forming. Sure, and um, that's why I'm saying it should be every It should be everybody. Right. And maybe in a workshop setting, not, not a full okay. board meeting. Okay. Um, not the first time, sure. but sure. absolutely. Yeah, and, and no, I mean, it won't wait until the middle of the summer and, and there's no notice, nothing, right. nothing like that. Because if Potts Grove would not agree to host us anymore for whatever reason, obviously you see what it takes to put together. Really, like Mrs. Grimm knows what it takes to put together. Um, it's not something you do in a month or two. I mean, being a team captain for, six, uh, for 20 years, it can take me six months just to put on a breakfast with Santa Claus. And that's one little event, so a relay for life event is huge and there's many pieces of the puzzle so we just don't want to be you know Understood. sure so thank you very much you. Jenny just before you go one thing I would like to um, just chime in on I would like to see it be a, a, a board workshop I don't really feel that the American Cancer Society should have to come here in public um, because I can only imagine the questions that they would be fired at sure and I and honestly it would um, really be shameful um, so I don't know. I know we're busy with the budget, but I, I do think that we could start this sooner than waiting. I know we're busy with the budget, sure. but to do a workshop, I don't think it's anything to put together. Sure. So um, don't forget to keep me involved in case I, I will. get lost I'll in the loop. I will. I'll reach out because um, I kind of, since I've done it so long now, kind of have the complete history of what Relay, you know, has been for us. Um, and of course, on a personal end, unfortunately, I can speak for that too. Uh, I literally left. Pottstown Hospital to be here um, from my sister. She's admitted right now. So um, I would like to be a part of it on many different levels. So, um, you know, if we could just keep in touch. Well, okay. I'm going to chime in now. Um, okay. I just uh, wanted to say that as one of the people who uh, did raise some questions at mm -hmm. the uh, board meeting in August, mm -hmm. um, I've taken quite a bit of time to, uh, yes, to reflect on the various components of uh, of the relay and uh, and a I want to say that I'm 100% in favor of approving it for um, the next year despite the questions that I raised and B I don't personally believe that raising questions whether in public or private are shameful and I reject that notion uh, uh, very strongly um, uh, we're all in this together sure. um, all of us have had people in our families with cancer my mother just got over cancer um, her second round of it yep. um, uh, and I don't believe there's a person in this room who doesn't have somebody close to them who's, uh, who's been through it. So um, uh, I reject the shameful notion, but I look forward to the discussion and, uh, you. and um, you know, the, ACE, the relay uh, I think is great for our community and should continue. Thank you, Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And if I can just say too, I do believe that the ACS should be at this workshop. There's okay. no reason for them not to be. Oh, sure. You, and I have just, to not to interrupt. Right. They, well, Patty just said they don't need to be. I do oh, believe okay. they need to be. Board meeting. She meant. 
workshop. Yes, they have um, the American Cancer Society is willing to do anything. Um, they are willing to answer any questions you have, and um, you know they're they're willing to do anything you would like to have your questions 110% answered, so that we're all on the same page. Um, so, thank you very much for your time. Okay, it gives me a great honor tonight to for the report of the superintendent to have some uh, special recognitions uh, tonight. And um, first thing I'd like to do is talk tonight about the Potts Grove High School football team uh, who represent District 1 as our Quad A champions. Uh, that victory was an exciting overtime victory over a heavily favored Interboro team and uh, who entered the championship game with a record of 10-2. and two. Uh, Although this team returned only a few starters from last year, uh, they were able to blend their young talent with some experienced players uh, for their third district title. Um, it uh, gr gives me great honor tonight to, to, uh, to recognize this particular group. Um, and I think that uh, one thing that uh, for me is very, very important is the relationships that you as teammates build. And um, I'm just going to give you a real brief history because I, I can, I guess. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, you young men in the audience um, have a great leader in Coach Pennypacker. And I say that because um, I've had opportunity to know him for almost 30 years. And uh, you in the room haven't been quite been born that, that you're not that old, <laughs> obviously. But you're going to reflect back on the relationships that you've had with your coaches, especially your head coach. And you're going to take the opportunity to realize how important this time in your life was and what, what the model of leadership has done for you. You're going to take this day in your career at Potts Grove academically and athletically, and you're going, to, you're going to use those tools the rest of your life. And the blessing for that is that you, you have a leader in Coach Pennypacker that has instilled that for a long, long time. And uh, I just wanted to express for me, because I've known Coach for, like I said, almost 28 years. We've competed together. And yes, Coach, you've, you've beat me more times than I beat you. Okay, let's get it out there. I get that. And that's, that's all good stuff. But one of the things I can always say in the competition that we had with one another was the respect that we had for one another and the ability to compete at a very high level. And those types of things have transferred for me through my entire life. It's work ethic. Uh, it's camaraderie. It's the rigor component, and it's things that you're never, ever going to forget. Tonight's going to be a quick blur for you, but when you have a chance to reflect on this night and what you've done as a team and an organization, you're going to be very, very proud. So uh, it's a great night for me because I have an opportunity uh, to work with someone like Coach Pennypacker. I've known him for many, many, many years. He hasn't changed a bit as far as what he believes and what's right and best for kids. So obviously, you know that as parents. You know that as his players, and uh, we want to see this continue for, for quite a long time. So it gives me a great honor and privilege tonight. Uh, we would like you to recognize you and the jackets that the board has supported you into recognizing this championship. We have certificates for you as well, and uh, we'd like the coach to come up and say a few words regarding this uh, Quad A championship team. make it very brief because Dr. Ziegler is pointing to his watch at me. We want to thank the board for all the support you give us. These guys got jackets, plaques, um, we have the best uniforms and best equipment and that doesn't go unnoticed by us and we thank you for everything that you do for us. These kids out here, the one thing that a lot of people don't know are some of the things that happen behind the scene. Uh, they do a lot of community service. They, uh, they do things that not many people know about. That's what I'm proud of them the most. They do, uh, they set flags on graves during Veterans Day. They went down and helped um, Pottstown uh, Senior Citizen Center move into their new home. They are going to go Thursday down to Lower Pottstown, read across America. They do a lot of things that not other people don't know about. 
That's what I'm proud of. The district championships, one thing, but the things that they do for the school and for the community, uh, that's what makes me proud of them. And coaching for over 35 years, and Dr. Shirk, uh, he was just as good a football coach as he is a superintendent, believe me. He was a very good football coach. But uh, coaching for 35 years, it's, it's, I'm very proud of this group of kids and uh, the way they represent Pasco. So we want to thank you for everything you do for us. Uh, I think my captains, uh, they want to come up and say anything. Ryan, do you want to say anything? Ryan will say a couple words and then we'll get out of here. <laughs> Everybody knows Ryan Finn, uh, our, our captain, and he's also our uh, district champion in wrestling. So he'll probably be here soon. Uh, um, like Coach Penny Packer said, just on behalf of the football team and us players, um, thank you for the district jackets. Um, it's great to know that we have a school board that supports our team, our athletic program, and the football players. And uh, it's a great thing for us to proudly wear our jackets in the school. And thank you. See you. Thank you. You're most welcome.
Okay, the next, the next uh, part of our presentation tonight uh, will be an enrollment study, and um, we are going to uh, start that with Mr. Nestor uh, going over uh, the current uh, projections. Thank you, Dr. Scherr. Tonight we have uh, our consultant calling in from Ohio. Uh, her name is Tracy Healy from Future Think Incorporated. Uh, she's done an enrollment study for the Potts Grove School District. Uh, projecting the enrollment for the next 10 years, uh, inclusive of potential housing developments uh, that are proposed in our in our neighborhood. So with that being said, I'm going to uh, pass off to uh, Mrs. Healy, and uh, the one thing I want to stress to you is she's probably not going to be able to hear your questions from the far side, so I'm going to act as translator uh, to her over our cell phone. So. Uh, please bear with us as we go through that process. With that being said, Tracy, we're ready to go. Okay, great. Well, thank you um, for having me. It's my pleasure to be with you at least via phone, and um, we can go through the PowerPoint, and then, as we said, ask um, questions after we get through that. That'll probably be the easiest way to do it, just because of the um, connection here. Um, so if we can get started with the next slide. and. First one is just a little bit about Future Think. We've been in operation for almost 11 years now. Um, I am the owner and president and have been in the business since the early um, 90s um, uh, as Future Think for the last 10 years. Next slide. Um, I specialize in providing enrollment projections and I have several long-term clients I've worked with. There are a few listed here and actually worked um, back with your district back in um, 2009. So I'm glad to be back working with you again. Next slide. In terms of the enrollment projections, there are several factors that are considered in putting together. Um, the first is obviously the historical enrollment. What's happened in the district over the past um, 10 years is you know, an indicator of what may happen in the future. So that's the first thing we look at is the historical enrollment. Secondly, we look at birth data. This provides us with kind of a pool of potential um, future students. So we look at the number of births and how that's trending over the last 15 years so that we can see um, as a comparison to your kindergarten enrollment five to six years after that birth occurs. So we look at the birth data. We'll also look at some general population demographics, just kind of what's happening generally in terms of population, what's happening in terms of economics in the area, and, and how that may impact enrollment. And of course, we look at housing development as new housing is coming into the area, what may be the potential impact and number of new students. And then we'll also look at the survival ratios, and that measures the movement of students through your system grade to grade, year by year and what that retention rate is as, as you move forward through um, through those years. Next slide. In terms of methodology, and I want to just point out too in the upper um, right-hand corner, I have kind of the page numbers. So if you're following along in your report as well, that's kind of where, where we're at. Um, in terms of the methodology, what we looked at was um, we developed district-wide projections as well as by school projections. So I wanted to look at the district wide first, giving us um, you know, kind of the overall picture and then look at how that impacted each of the elementary schools. We started with the cohort survival method as the primary um, methodology measuring, you know, what I just talked about in terms of the, the survival ratios and that historical enrollment grade to grade year by year. And then incorporated the housing development into that cohort projection through um, the development of projection ratios. So look at how the housing may impact future enrollment and increase those ratios moving forward. Um, once the district-wide projections were completed, then looked at developing the bi-school projections and compared and reconciled those with the district-wide. The reason they start with the district-wide is that looking at you know a greater population and those are going to have a higher level of accuracy. The smaller the group, the you know the harder it is to pinpoint exactly. Um, so look at the overall picture first, and then develop those projections by school afterward. Next slide. 
Looking at the historical enrollment, over the past 10 years, there's been an increase of 100 students, or 3%. Um, and then over the last five years, the increase has been about approximately 1%. So it's been pretty flat over the last five years overall. We've seen some changes, if we turn to the next slide, in um, the grade levels. So for um, grades K through 2, we have a um, enrollment this year of 763, which is one of the highest years. We had a high year 771 in 2010-11, but so we've seen an increase over you know the past few years in terms of that K2 enrollment. Same with the 3-5 enrollment. While we saw a peak in the 12-13 school year, also at 763, we've also you know almost returned to that level this year at 759 students. And we've seen a little bit of decline um, in the middle and high school levels, but fairly, fairly flat as, as, um, as time has gone on. So as we're seeing those elementary school um, increases, then as the students move through, obviously they're going to start hitting in the middle and high school levels as we get into that, you know, late in the later years of the 10-year projection. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Next slide shows the number of birth counts. Um, the lo we have the lowest number of birth counts in 2014, which is the last year available. We look at this um, from the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and what they do is look at the resident of the mother. So regardless of where the mom may have the baby, um, if she goes outside of the county or outside of the township to have the baby, the birth is counted within the residence where she lives. So we have that broken down by lower, upper, and west Pat Grove townships. You can see what those totals are. So again, we want to look at this so we can get an idea of what kindergarten enrollment may look like five years later. So this year's um, kindergarten would approximately be born in 2011, which was um, a total of 260 births. Um, as we saw in the previous slide, we had a you know, 700, or I'm sorry, I have to back here, my own, um, 243 for kindergarten this year, so kind of great, almost at 100% in terms of the number of births and then the number of children that we saw in kindergarten five years later. Next slide. Um, this slide just shows some general indicators of growth and wealth in the area. First um, table shows Montgomery County and Pennsylvania, just in terms of per capita income, median household income, and persons below poverty. Obviously, Montgomery County is in you know a higher wealth position and a better economic position than the state overall. Um, in terms of some of the census data for the county and Pittsburgh borough. Custom borough and the township, seeing the modest growth in each of those areas over over the 10-year um, census window and then the 15-year estimate for 2015. Next slide. <coughs> this um, shows S3 projections, which S3 is the group that um, has provided like the ARC GIS and geographic information system management. Um, these look at, this is data that we actually purchased from them, to so look at census block group. So they take it to the lowest level that the census provides data, and we can roll that up to approximate the district as closely as possible. So while in the previous slide we were looking at county and the township data, this shows what the Pottsburg district so on this first chart shows the total population, which is projected from an estimate of 2016 to a five-year projection of, in 2021, of an increase of about 2% for the total population within the um, district. And looking at it by um, ages zero through 18, you see just a slight increase is projected of 32 students or less than 1% over that five-year window. But you can see there's some projected losses in the zero to nine age groups and the projected 
16s and the 10 to 14 and 15 to 18. So as I mentioned, as we've seen those increases in the elementary levels of higher, as we move out in five years or so, those are you know, starting to move into the middle school grade. Next slide. This also shows um, as we projections and also the median and average household income, average family size, and total family households which are all projected to increase over that five-year window as well. This um, next slide shows this, all of this data um, in math. So as I said, it's you know, linked to the, each census block group. So the first one looks at the total population growth and decline. So there's just a couple little areas of red where there's a slight <coughs> decline projected, but you can see the rest of the district is all projected as you grow. And the light, um, lighter green is from a 4.1 to 6% growth. Um, and some of the yellow is from 2 to 4%. And the orange is from 2 or less percent growth. So see around the district where there's projected growth and just some slight decline kind of right in that center area where that red is. The next slide shows um, for ages 5 to 18, so their school age population and where those losses and declines are. So you can see in the areas of light green, dark green, um, medium green, those are areas where it's projected to increase in the number of student age children in the red. Well, Red, um, orange, and yellow are showing some areas of loss. So, um, in the eastern portion, you know, southern portion, we see where that's you know, kind of the biggest area where it's projected to increase by 8% or more. The next slide shows median age. This, um, just for each of the areas, the light green is 35 to 40 age. That's kind of where the most um, in the district. And on the next slide, it shows in 2021 what it's projected to be. So we see that um, light green getting and the yellow becoming more. So as people age with five years, they're now looking at more 40 to 45 um, their age population. And the next slide shows um, current estimated median income. See the dark green is greater than $100,000, and then it goes down to areas of red where it's under $60,000. So again, kind of see in and around the district where those areas of greater wealth are. And the next slide shows the projection for 2021, where those all increase um, greatly so as, as we move forward those five years see how that changes over time. In terms of the next slide, it shows the number of building permits. Um, we saw the total peak in 2006, right, where, while we were still kind of in the housing boom. And then see in 2009, 2010, kind of entered the um, housing bus as we've gone um, forward where those, those dipped um, quite significantly. And over the past four years, we're starting to see, I think, some signs of recovery. And based on um, the housing developments that you know, are you know, starting to occur in the area, we um, you know, see more housing probably to come as we move forward. The next slide shows those housing developments. Um, Saratoga Green, which is um, projected to have a total of 503 units broken out with studio and one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom townhomes. There's also Spring Valley Farms, which is um, 178 units of three and four bedroom homes. And then in Upper Pottsville, there's um, talk of a development of 58 units occurring, but at this time, no approvals are in place. But I wanted to include that as um, some potential development as well, see how how that may move forward. The next slide shows the survival ratios. This is measuring the movement of students, as I mentioned, um, grade to grade, year by year. Um, as we look at 
I'll go through Bible ratios for the movement from K to 1 through 11 to 12th grade. On average, they equal or exceed 100%. So that means that all the students that were there the previous grade typically show up the next year, and in many cases, you have more students than you had the previous year um, in those grade levels. Um, there is a couple of exceptions, grades um, 1 to 2, where the average over the last 10 years was about 99%, so right, just right at that 100%, and actually for this year it was 104%, so you actually had a few more second graders than you did first graders last year. And then 10 to 11 is typical, um, is that I, I haven't seen a district where it equals on average over 100%, just because of the way um, some of the credits count for students in terms of um, where, when they're classified during the year as either a 10th or 11th grader, and as well as there are students who leave to pursue like a, at another school or a vocational school or something like that. There's um, usually, there can be a little bit of stuff up there. But on average, you're seeing, you know, 100% or more retention moving forward within, um, within the grade. The next slide, we have the first um, projected enrollment. This is showing the district-wide most likely with an increase of 8% or, or 262 students, I think, um, in grades K through 12. And then we looked at that also by grade group and by um, school. So we looked at an increase of 13 students, I'm sorry, in the next slide, in um, pre-K through, or K through 12, I'm sorry, that's a typical that just said K-12. Um, 40 students increased in grades um, 3 through 5, 58 in grades 6 8, and 151 students in grades 9 through 12. As I mentioned, as, you know, we're seeing those bigger class sizes um, currently in the elementary as we move out in the, in the 10th year period, they're going to be middle and high school. The next slide um, shows what um, West Pest Grove Elementary School. So the first table shows the historical enrollment and you know, has that changed. So currently the enrollment is 293. We have the projected enrollment at 286 in the 10th year. So fairly flat in terms of the enrollment there. Next slide shows that Rainy Rock, we see um, a current enrollment of 470 students. And we have a projected enrollment of 490 in the 10th year. So, slight increase of about 20 students there. And then at Lower Potts Grove, we currently have 759 students in grades 3 through 5, and a projected 799 in the 10th year, an increase of 40 students at Lower Potts Grove Elementary School. Those are the um, moderate or most likely projections. We also provided low and high. Let's go to the next slide and give a quick explanation. The low shows um, what we're looking at is kind of a, if the inflation goes up, interest rates go up. I was talking, they might raise the interest rates. We still haven't seen a whole lot there. But if that were to occur and there was a yield, lower yield rate for new housing, somewhere more in the range of about a quarter of a student per unit, this would typically offset what would be a natural decline. So the housing, new housing would offset. So what we see in the low projection is a fairly flat projection in terms of enrollment. With the most likely or moderate projection that we just looked at, we're seeing you know, steady inflation and interest rates. So similar to what we have in the current market, so if that were to continue over the next 10 year period. With a moderate yield rate for new housing, somewhere in the 5.5 .5 to 0.6, um, student per unit, and we would see obviously the increase in student enrollment. We saw um, increase of 262 students in that most likely projection, based on what we're, we're seeing in terms of um, new housing development and what there what potential there may be in the next 10 year window. And then with the high projection, we're looking at the the lower inflation and interest rates than what we're seeing in the current market. Um, in a moderate yield rate for new housing, so a little bit higher than what we see, 0.75 student per unit, 
um, which would also result in an increased student enrollment. We go to the next slide. We have the low, as I said, you know, fairly flat, um, increase of less than 1%, you know, 25 students increase over the 10 year period. And go to the next slide with the district wide high with an increase of about 14%. This would um, take us to just over 3,700 students in the, in the 10th year for that enrollment. The next slide, um, just in terms of some conclusions and things to think about. Obviously, watching what the birth counts are and what the resulting kindergarten enrollment is. They so mentioned this year, or the 2014, um, the last year available birth was among the lowest that we've seen over the 15-year period. So it would, you know, think in that 2019-20 school year, we might see a dip in terms of some of the kindergarten enrollment unless new housing offsets that. Also, want to take a look at just what your overall elementary school enrollment is doing. You know, as that's going to be an indicator of future um, projections. Looking at any additional job creation um, in the area that would also spur new development and what the relationship is between the new housing development and the new students and what those yield factors are. I mentioned kind of used a range of yield factors from a 0.25 yield to a 0.75 yield and where that will fall. I know that there have been you know, some you know, look backs in terms of other housing development that's occurred in the district and what those yields are and they've kind of ranged within that and, and in some cases have exceeded. Um, so that's you know, something that you want to continue to monitor. And then any other changes that may impact enrollment, if there is a you know local private or parochial school that closes, or there are things you know that are happening that um, may impact enrollment. There's program change, other things um, that you want to monitor that they may have an impact too. So it's you know the projections you know measure a point in time and you know, are based on the best available data at that point in time. But certainly they're you know, a fluid thing. So as, as variables change or um, you know, those things need to be taken into consideration as time moves forward. So with that, I thank you and open it up for questions. Mr. Leach. The question I had was in regards to the enrollment projection considerations is housing sales included. I saw a new development, but what about housing sales? Uh, yes. Did you hear that? I, I did hear that one. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Dave. Um, yes, housing sales are considered, and if you look at the, um, going back to the survival ratios, because the, the movement of any new students into the district through the housing sales would be measured within those um, survival ratios. So that's how we track that because it's really um, difficult to track that any other way. Um, I mean, you basically would have to survey um, every person in the district that bought a house to find out what that yield is. But it is um, tracked through you know, the students are accounted for through the survival ratios in the housing sales. Mr. Hunter, what numbers did she come up with uh, for each? Um, what numbers did she come up with for each new proposed development? And uh, where did she, what formula did she use to calculate that? Uh, the question was what, uh, what formula did you use to calculate the uh, increases due to the new developments and what were the projected totals? Okay. Um, what I looked at was um, kind of a combination of the cohort survival methods so of measuring the rate of movement of students and then adjusted projection ratios based on this for the new housing. So I wanted, so it wasn't like a straight formula that said, okay, based on this housing development, we're going to get, you know, 50 students, and based on this one, we're going to get 75 students. 
what I didn't said was that um, looking at the Saratoga Green example, I projected that there could be at the 0.25 range um, because those apartments would typically generate less students per unit and based on some of those being studio and one bedroom apartments and et cetera. So that would, you know, equate to 126 students roughly. Um, and then for the Spring Valley farm, looking at that using more closer to that 0.75 ratio, which would be about 130 students or so. But it didn't just simply add that on top of the enrollment because we needed to also account for that movement of students year to year, grade to grade, and where where some bubbles may be and where that, that is. So it kind of did, it's not like just a straight formula in terms of it, but more of you know a combination, more kind of an art and a science, if you will, in terms of putting those together. So I looked at kind of you know the straight numbers in terms of what may be generated, but then kind of folded that into that cohort survival method measuring um, measuring that change over time. Uh, you may have looked, answered uh, this already, but um, going back to the to, to the question of how you calculated these numbers, did you take the developers' estimates of children into account in these calculations? Did you take the developers' uh, calculations on the student population points into consideration in your calculation? Um, Certainly that, that information was provided to me and I, I looked at that data. Um, I feel that, you know, those, you know, I, I, I mean, I considered that information, but as I said, I kind of used a higher um, calculation, especially for the Spring Valley Farms, than what, what they projected. That's actually was, I just wanted to, to ask you to clarify then. Um, uh, did, since you did have access to that information, you're saying you estimated a higher number of students than the developers, particularly at Spring Valley, but also at Santa Toga Green? Right. So, did, you, did you hear that? I heard, I heard part of it. Okay. The pizza, in the take, end of it. In taking the development's information into consideration, uh, Mr. Rosenowitz is just verifying that you used a larger, uh, you, you yielded a larger percentage, a larger number of students than the new housing development than they did. Yeah, 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 that's Could you say what uh, percentage higher you uh, you were than the developers? I think Lower Pottsgrove Township should have this information. Um, I would have to go back and look. I don't, I don't have that just okay. right off the top of my head. Questions? Um, there's two developments in consideration here, which is Sanatoga Green and um, Spring Valley. But yet, over the last couple of days, I have um, driven by um, the Sprobel's Run, which I thought was defunct, but it appears to be under construction. They are prepping that land for development. So was that taken into consideration at all? Um, it, no, no, it's not. No, this is a different one. It's right. It's it's right near. Yeah, no, the, not the rental, which was something circle or something. No, Sprogel's Run is the the property in front of that that actually. Um, <coughs> orders Gilbertsville Road and that is all within the last couple of days I, they've got they're clearing the land they've got the big barriers up they've got the like the surveyors flags and stuff I didn't know if that was something that was taken into consideration uh, we contacted Upper Potts Group that wasn't one of the developments that they identified as being forthcoming so uh, I don't know. We'll, I'll certainly inquire about about that to uh, to the township. That may be Douglas Township. 
I, I was thinking that too, that maybe, because it's really weird, the, the property lines there, the, the township lines are very strange there. Anything else from the board? You want to open it up to the public? Sure. Do you want to? Okay. What year did you use for the, uh, uh, for uh, the two projects to come on stream? The question was, what year do you anticipate the housing, uh, the students arriving from these new housing Um, We looked at that in 2014. Kind of occurring over um you know within like a two to three year period over the remaining 10 year period of time so as those units get built typically you see like a lifetime of a development um you know of a building permit being issued and then the student showing up roughly a year you know a year in the next school year that being said, there are some students in projected to uh, arrive within the 1718 school year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So 1718. Some some will start in 1718, and and then it will rise every year over the years, according to the projections. Now, obviously, yeah. if they don't start construction until 1819, it'll push back the projections. Okay. Okay. So I. I can't take the difference between 17 and 18 and say that's, you know, attribute that to the housing development. The I've question, got to spread it out over three or four years. The question was can she can we take the chain between 16 and 17 and 17 18 and attribute that to the development? Or is the, the uh, student increase factored in over the life of the it's affected in, the increase for new housing development is factored in over the 10 year projection and really for next year that increase is primarily due to students moving through um you know as they move in grades so as we look back at um you know this year kindergarten being higher and some of the, the elementary being higher than the high school moving out we're going to see some increase just simply as you know, students move out and new students move in. So that'll, that'll be part of it as well. It's a natural movement. I'm just going to break yeah. in uh, here. Uh, I uh, used the power of Google to uh, answer this program's wrong question. Um, there's a 2015 article in which Upper Pottsgrove Pots uh, approved 58 units for Sprogo's run. Um, 29 in the first phase and 29 in the second. They'd be single um, family homes, I believe. So um, I'm not. I wonder why they didn't provide that. Well, there is. If you refer back to your presentation, there is a 58 unit development that they said was uh, on yeah. the books, but not, they had not had any approvals yet. And so yet, at that, it, point, at that point in time, it had not. This is 2015. It, but and there are multiple levels of approval before you can get to construction. I get that. Okay. Um, but it's according to the construction, construction, construction is sorry. But we will, we will inquire. I drive past it every day. Okay. It, it changed a lot over okay. the last week. Okay. And where are things at with the old orchards? Uh, I spoke with the township manager for Lower Potts Grove, and uh, first off, uh, a large chunk of the orchard property is in New Hanover Township, I believe. Uh, so only the frontage is on on our property. Um, and, but at this point in time, there's been no action. No developer has expressed interest in the property yet. Okay, seeing no more questions. Uh, Tracy, thank you very much for your information. And uh, if we have any more questions as we go through the process, uh, we'll get back in touch with you. That sounds great. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Dave, All right. Good night. Good question for you or maybe operations or somebody. What are the building capacities? Um, 
Building capacities are defined in different ways. Uh, certainly PDE's concept of building capacities are greater than how many kids are actually in the building. Uh, I don't have that information, but I will get it for an next meeting. Actually, I wanted to uh, piggyback on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was looking through the enrollment projections, particularly at Lower Pottsgrove, um, I saw a peak of 816 students in 2021 or 22, I don't remember the year. Um, and uh, knowing, having just graduated from uh, Lower Pottsgrove uh, at around 750, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on our ability to handle even that large an increase in that particular school? Well, we have, we have identified two, two buildings as being our biggest pressure points. One is Lower Pottsburg Elementary School, the other is the middle school. Uh, you'll see that there's even even larger increases for the middle school in, in some of the years. Uh, so now that we have this information, we actually have a meeting scheduled with the building principals uh, on the 7th to discuss uh, the, change, the potential changes in enrollment and to try and start the, the thought process of how to accommodate those students if this, if this enrollment uh, comes our way, uh, but certainly one one major uh, possibility out there is that we may need to add space, whether it be in the form of temporary classrooms or uh, permanent structure at one or both of those buildings. Well, my big concern about that, um, I mean, adding classroom space, well, that's a calculable cost, right? Um, you know, we could convert the portico to classroom space. That was one of the ideas I've seen. Um, um, my concern is uh, is whether the uh, infrastructure of the school itself can accommodate that number of students. For example, uh, you know, getting them through the lunchroom in a timely way. Um, just that's yeah. that well, simple amount. We, we need to look at all, all aspects of the program because it's pretty tight now. Mm -hmm. There, mm -hmm. so getting it another 60, 70 students could be a chore. Okay. Just a quick question in regards to West. Um, back in before the centers, there was 454 some odd students. Now there's 293 some odd students. What are we doing with that extra space? Uh, currently, we have uh, several classrooms rented to the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit for some of their early intervention classes and special uh, special needs classrooms. Uh, but there is capacity there that uh, we could. Uh, shift more students to that building uh, if that was if that's our desire. Um, well, sorry, just another question. Yeah. So, what would be our plan then in, in the very near future to compare our numbers with Lower Potts Grove's people's numbers? Um, <clears throat> If the board grants me the authority, I would go to a future board meeting and present them with a copy of this report and express what concerns we may have. Do you need a motion? No, just a directive would be fine. Okay, well, I support that directive. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph. Question, if I may? Yeah. Al mentioned the centers, so I think it's fair to bring it up. Has the move to the centers given the new population projections that we're expecting, actually complicated or exacerbated our problem? The move to centers did a couple things. One, it allowed us to do full day kindergarten. Okay, so that was certainly a, a positive uh, step for Potsgrove. It also consolidated all the three through sixth grade teachers in one building, which allowed to us to more easily balance the student population. Um, the bottom line is uh, the majority of the new students are coming from the eastern edge of the district, which would all feed into either Lower Pottsgrove Elementary School or Ringing Rocks Elementary School, no matter what. So um, <clears throat> certainly lower is, is closest to capacity at this point in time, and that's going to be our biggest pressure point. But I'm not certain it wouldn't have been the the, the largest pressure point uh, prior to that if we're adding every all the student population from the, the eastern end of the district. 
Thank you. Okay. What is the next steps where we're going to use this material? We're just going to wait and see what happens. What's next? No, uh, like I said, next week we're going to have a conversation with our staff to, to see what we can start a, a process for breaking it down grade by grade and seeing what what potential impact is going to have on our program, what space needs we have, we will have, what additional teaching needs we may have as a result of this, and whatnot. Uh, as we work through that process, then it will come up with a, a, a grander uh, idea of what what we're going to need to do. And at that point in time, we'll come back uh, probably through the, the facilities and operations committee to discuss what we think the potential impacts of this are. Certainly, if we if if we come in at the lower end of the the projection, the issues aren't aren't as severe. If we come in at the moderate level, which is what we're going to use as our planning level, um, they're significant, but maybe not insurmountable. If we come in at the higher level, um, you know, we're going to have some challenges. What then would be say a lead time? Obviously, this is all we're hoping the lower numbers, but. Is it like two years in advance? We need to know two years in advance if we're going to be putting in plans for buildings, or we're we looking at uh, we're pretty good, we're pretty safe, and we could probably construct something within relatively quick little time frame. I, I think if you look at it, the the pressure points, uh, the biggest pressure points hit in about four years, four to six years. So we have a little bit of time to plan for that if we if we can if we if we make a determination in the near near future. Uh, my goal is, I think, if we could have a um, kind of like a plan. I haven't talked to Dr. Shirk about this, but maybe by the start of school next year, have it have it vetted out and come up with a, an idea of what what we think we can do versus what we think we need to add structurally to to accommodate these these steps. We might be sooner, but I want to give us a little bit of time to to do our our due diligence. And I think that, as Dave mentioned, the first start is next week when we have an opportunity to break down the individual buildings and to talk to those principals about what's available, what's, what's currently available you know, as far as space goes. Um, obviously, we, have, we know what's some space, uh, we have some space at West. What's rocks capacity because of this is where we stand heavy, and do we have any, any space, you know, question mark, and lower as far as, you know, that, that piece. And then, of course, obviously, it's a trickle up to the middle school. So. We want, we want to get a first-hand, really, I think the, our building principal would be our first step of, of uh, answering some of those questions. And, and Dave, if there's any delay, obviously, that keeps moving. It's a, it's a, it's a, Correct. You know, so it's a, it could be a moving target for us that we'd have to continually monitor um, as we go through the process. Dr. Shirk, I would just ask that uh, while you're going through that process that you take a, <clears throat> a, a hard, realistic look at how things are now um, particularly at lower, mm -hmm. but also at the middle. Sure. Um, uh, you know, beyond just the capacity of the classrooms themselves. Um, you know, because uh, I think that's an area where, where I know I've heard from parents and I've witnessed myself uh, that it's strained, to say the least, uh, now. So, uh, you know, uh, I think it's important for us to be realistic about where we might be, and I just ask that you come to us with, uh, with uh, you know, scenarios that maybe we don't want to hear, but understood. But maybe we need to hear. Yep. Dr. Shirk, um, if we have to shift students, is that a redistricting scenario, or is it something less formal than that? Uh, not ne not necessarily, and I think that's sort of that's that's one of our first steps. Uh, when we meet with the, you know, the principals uh, to take a look at obviously the infrastructure as I just mentioned I think that's key and then that would that would be a recommendation from us to come back to the board with if we have to draw the line you know closer closer east if you will where more students would end up going to west um, you know ultimately you know we have to that would be a, that would be something we bring to the board because that affects community so thank you sir yeah. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs>
just add on to that last comment. Um, just want to add on to that last comment. Thank you. Um, you know, anything to that effect that's brought to this board, I think it's safe to say, would be is basically saying it's being brought to the community. Uh, we would certainly uh, want to be hearing from the community, and not a decision that we would take lightly at all. Is, uh, is where my perspective, and I think safe to say for the board. <clears throat> Okay, uh, we'd like to move on with our meeting to uh, have action items for personnel. I'd like to make, make a motion to include 5.1 through 5.8 and 5.9, only excluding 5.10, uh, including 5.10, only excluding 5.9. 5 1 through 5.8 and 5.10. Okay. And we'll have 5.2. 5.2. Five twos out. Five twos out. Five twelve, eleven, I think, is actually. That's this just actually. So. And five six. Can we just? Well, I'll just go. I want to keep them individual. Let's just go through them. Let's just go through them one by one. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to start with five point one. Uh, our recommendation is to approve the administrative staff appointment as submitted. So moved. Second. second. Motion and a second. Congratulations. Any questions? There's a motion and a second, so I was just asking if we had any questions or comments. No questions. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I'd like to welcome Anthony Be Becker to board. Congratulations, Tony. <laughs> professional staff leave. We make a recommendation to approve the professional staff leave of absence as submitted. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? All in favor? Cool. Aye. 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 Question. Got to be quicker on that. Well, it's not working good tonight. Uh, I don't know if it's something I can ask here. If I can ask a general question in regards to long-term subs taking um, 12 weeks of 12 weeks of medical leave. Um, we have two this time. It just struck me as as odd because it's a, should I say a temporary position as it is. I, could we, could I get a little more information on that? It's pr pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, um, I, don't, I don't really, at this point, you know, they, they, uh, they have that ability to take that leave. So we wouldn't deny that. So um, I'm not. Do, does the 12 week, do we know, if, if you don't know offhand, obviously that's fine. No. But I wonder if the, how long the long term sub is for, or is that typically for the school year? For the a long, the a long term year? sub would be either for, for the school year or for 90 days. So that would be a, a long term per diem sub. They would fall into the X amount of days at 100, X amount of days at 110, X amount of days. If they would be in a position for more than 30 days, then it would be the bachelor's in one rate. So that, that could occur for that particular, those particular spots. But it's not going to be a long-term sub with benefits or part benefits or anything like that. I think a legitimate question here is, uh, do, uh, is this uh, leave available to them under FMLA um, uh, or under district policy or under our union contract? Those are the three possibilities. Right. Which one? Or Family one? medical. Family medical. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there's no other questions. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Professional staff appointment. We recommend you approve the professional staff appointments as submitted. So moved. 
Second. second. Motion and a second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. No relation, right? Miscellaneous, miscellaneous staff appointment. Uh, we recommend you approve the miscellaneous staff appointment as submitted. So moved. Second. second. Motion and a second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carries. 5.5, support staff resignation. We ask you to approve this resignation as submitted. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any questions? <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, 5.6, uh, clef, uh, classification change. We recommend that you approve this classification change as submitted. Second. Any questions? Question. Um, the position was previously held by contracted staff and now changed. So why the difference and what is the difference uh, as, far as, as far as its effect on us? It's not going to, I'm going to vote yes. I'm just curious. You can get back to me on that later if you'd like to. That's fine. Yeah. D David, any, any particular comment you could add to that at this point without getting, I, talking I, it? I would be guessing. Same. Let me, let me verify it. That's fine. I, I don't need it for my vote. Okay. All in favor then? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, support staff appointments. Uh, we ask you to please approve the support staff appointments as submitted. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion carries. Uh, 5.8, student teacher placement. We ask that you approve the student teacher placement as submitted. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any questions or comments on this one? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Miscellaneous supplemental special payment appointments. We ask that you approve the supplemental special payments appointments as submitted. Second. Motion and a second. Any questions or comments? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thanks, Patty. Uh, motion carries uh, with eight yeses and one abstention. We ask that you uh, approve the revised job descriptions as submitted uh, in 5.10. 5 Second. Second. Motion and a second. Questions or comments? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion carried. Okay, moving on to action items for business. We ask that you approve the construction invoice for the Proscript High School renovation project as presented. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Questions? Yeah, I got a, just a simple question here. Balance to finish is $3,000. Why didn't we just throw that in? We didn't uh, have all the paperwork presented, so we're, we're not going to pay until they present the, the invoice for payment. Uh, do they have uh, any pending? Uh, the the plumbing contractor has been off site for uh, quite some time. They're for all intents and purposes complete. Hundred percent finished. Yes. They didn't have anything to do with the HVAC. Well, if there's changes to the HVAC that require plumbing, they may have to come back. But they've completed their work. Okay. Appropriately. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Number seven, action items for education. We ask that you approve the conference attendance as submitted. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 7.2, conference at attendance. We ask that you approve this conference. Attendance as requested and submitted. So moved. Second. And a motion and a second. Questions or comments? All in favor? 
Action items for uh, policies, we ask the board uh, to approve uh, the new policies as submitted. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, I have one question, but does anybody else have anything? Else? Yeah, I had just one simple question. Uh, in the live stream video part, it talks about the camera use. Is camera going to be sort of like all-encompassing phones? <coughs> cameras, GoPros, the computers, anything at all that could be electronically recording anything? Yes. <laughs> I'll just comment back, yes, that we did discuss that, yeah. impact, that specific piece in the policy committee and it's meant to cover any kind of recording live stream or post live stream. Um, my comment was just that I always like to check beforehand when we approve these policies, but do we have any uh, public feedback on either of these two during the 30-day? We did not. Okay. Any more comments or questions? I would just like, say, like to say concerning the live streaming um, for homebound instruction, uh, we, I, it would have been wonderful when my son was home after his multiple surgeries to have had that and I, I'm just really happy you guys have, that you guys included that because that can make a huge difference for a student that's at home recovering from anything you know for any long period of time so it's just a, a it would have been a huge help in his case and rather than paying you know and having the tutors coming in after school and stuff like that you know so I'm just very happy to see that happening Uh, I haven't read the policy. Is there anything in it which would prevent your friendly neighborhood newspaper reporter from live streaming video of, say, reading or like that? All right, should we hold this policy then? Because <laughs> <laughs> I will say no. Hey, what are your newspaper reporters that aren't friendly? <laughs> I think there's a disclaimer, I think, isn't it? What was he? It's got Evan's name on it. Yeah. It's, it's got a disclaimer. It's, mo it's for classroom. For, for yeah. during school time. Thank you. Thank you. Another question that came up during that, during the discussion at policy committee, though, yet yeah, we did talk about these meetings, okay. yeah. sporting events, things like that. But this is specifically for classroom time during the school day. Thank you, sir. I do have one other question that I just thought of. Um, I didn't see it in the in the policy. Uh, I think I actually saw it as being excluded. Uh, for students like the homeschooling students and stuff like that, uh, I think we're not going to keep the videos. Is that correct? So if you have a student that did, missed it for whatever reason, being they're not going to be able to go back a week. Is that correct? We're not going to keep the no. stream. No. It's just a live. live. I know we said we weren't going to. Right, it's live only. Yeah, live only. Right. No so recording. Correct. That was not live. No, present. Was that brought up? Because I would think that would be something would be very beneficial to students that are either sick, homeschool. I mean, there's many different reasons. I could say, again, I hate to use my experiences, but a lot of colleges record all of the classes, and then students then can sit there and say, "Hey, I forgot what you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith went over on you know third period three weeks ago," and they can look back and see it. Has that been considered? Maintaining cataloging and, and right. That, this, that could be a this was just a yeah. I think that's a separate policy. It, correct. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the policy doesn't address whether we can or can't. Okay. So it would have to be something to vote up in a new policy if we if we want. Right. Or just the operating instruction. Right. I will say, um, in other instances of homebound instruction that I've been told about. Um, where this kind of live streaming was used. Usually it was a student carrying a laptop with them during the day, and just when they'd sit down, they'd flip it around, and there the student at home was able to just follow along with the class. So that, that's what I was told about. My, my niece did that up in LaGuardia High School in New York when she was out after a surgery. So I was like, man, what a great idea. <coughs> 
Are we ready? Was no. this was this policy reviewed by the attorneys? Just to make no. sure they didn't have any questions or concerns. Okay. It's also reviewed by PSPA too. They're they're they're. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Great. This is Graham, Joint Operating. Um, thank you. Um, I don't have a full report because I want to do that the first meeting of each month. Um, but I do have a couple updates that we're kind of excited for. Is this coming Monday is going to be our JOC meeting, and we're actually having uh, a Mexican buffet. In the past, I've told you we've had dinners that have sold out seven in a row. Um, we actually have to turn people away. We can't. We can't even, you know, fill the seats. So, um, so Mexican week is our dinner buffet is going to be this week, and the kids have been really busy making the menu. Um, homemade chips. They're doing Mexican rice, and and it's not just a buffet. These kids actually are learning more of the specific culinary arts, the arts of it. So um, it's thirteen dollars, and it's from four thirty to seven. And our meeting starts at 7, and we invite everybody to come to our meetings. <laughs> and um, Monday, Monday, I'm sorry, it will be March the 6th. Um, we're very excited to um, bring to everybody's attention. We have four students that were announced today going to do a pilot program with Chick-fil-A Academy. And it's a great opportunity for our students to kind of learn the business end, ordering food, um, customer relations, and um, so we're really excited about that. And then in May, we're uh, coordinating a high tea event. Um, so they're always working. There's always something going on over there. Um, I really would like to um, a shout out to the, to the Western Center because they are taking these kids above and beyond. You know, sometimes they're overlooked, but they are they're doing amazing things. And I'm just very, very proud of them. So next meeting. Um, can I add? Sure. I'm, I'm trying to come through a, a Facebook page. Thank you. I'm trying to thumb through the Facebook page, and I can't find it uh, fast enough. But I know that uh, Mr. Mars Martin posted on the PGSD discussion page, maybe maybe the high school discussion page too, um, about the middle school. And I got a mailer home, a, a, a postcard mailer about the summer camps um, that they, they have offered. I, I would encourage everybody to just uh, yeah. check out what the offerings are. That I know they did They did add like a, a sports uh, yes. sports fitness program this culinary year. Art, for, auto, yep, uh, there's, a, there's an arts, a culinary arts, an auto, I mean, great summer camps open to anyone. Fifth um, eighth grade students, but right. I'll do that on my full report. Okay. Week, I, I, I don't know how fast they fill up, that's why I just wanted to, yeah. to mention it. I have it here. Uh, registration forms are available now. Grades five through eight offered to all students. Uh, and then there, there's session dates. Uh, so uh, you're going to report out on that uh, next week. But uh, but the sessions run in ju the middle of July. It looks like. All of them are, uh, are July 10th through July 14th, and there's a sports performance, and there's uh, a couple of others here. So. Can I just clarify, uh, back up just for a second, in regards to the policy of live streaming, I just want to be clear. The policy uh, I checked is very clear. No recordings will occur on either event, either end of the live stream. Just want to clarify that. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move on to uh, the other committee items. That's correct. Uh, the Facilities and Operations Committee uh, met on 214, and um, we have a report. We don't. I missed it because I was here. I missed the time. So, okay. actually, it was run. President. Oh, that was the budget committee meeting. Yeah, the budget meeting. Yeah. So it was five minutes for the Right. 
just just to update the public uh, at our last facilities and operations uh, committee uh, we spent um, you know uh, over an hour just uh, basically mr. Nestor gave a, a budget budget presentation uh, on the, on the projections for 2017 18 and we did spend a little bit of time talking about the capital improvements uh, at the middle school and to uh, think about uh, the, the committee was asked to uh, think about some of the uh, ways that uh, we should move forward with that capital project and they will be forthcoming uh, you know in the next couple months as far as recommendations uh, for uh, for the middle school mr. Carwell anything you would want to add regarding that piece or the other piece was uh, that uh, <coughs> mr. Nash and I developed a uh, list of <coughs> error and omissions from the change orders that we'll be presenting to the uh, to the board for the next committee uh, meeting to review our areas that areas that we believe should be farther into. Thank you, Mr. Carwell. Uh, curriculum and technology. Uh, we have a report from them from our February 21st meeting. So this was our big meeting that will be coming to the board in a future time in regards to the change in the curriculum. Uh, I want to point out that we had over 100 of teachers and staff that actually were involved with creating the doing curriculums. And we actually had over 40 teachers actually at our meeting this past Tuesday that came. And the discussion was very lively, back and forth. We were able to get all everything down to exactly what was going on and such. So I'm going to break this. It's like eight, nine pages here. So I'm going to break this down. Uh, there were a few negotiables, non-negotiables, and stuff like that. And in essence, it came down to, for mathematics, the team wanted to go with the Pearson and Visions for, uh, that's mathematics, 9 through 12. For 9 through 12 for ELA, the teachers felt that we had the curriculum that was needed. For grades 6 through 8 in mathematics, it's still pending. They do know that they're going to want to change the curriculum, but they just haven't decided on the exact version of the curriculum. They know they want to work with, obviously, being in the middle. They need to work with the high school and with the elementary school, so they're going to be working still on the mathematics. As for the uh, six to eight ELA, you got my perspectives from Pearson. For K through five mathematics, it's going to be math and focus. I think this is, a, I think some people are very happy as this is going to be the end of EDM. So there will be no more EDM. And obviously, I didn't already say it, but Carnegie Math is also going to be out come next year. So you students, well, not you, Maya, but Mason, you may be happier. All right, as for uh, K through five ELA, it's going to be reading wonders. And a lot of other things now, there were multiple board members besides the commission that was here. We all, at commission, yeah, committee, as we all uh, unanimously agreed to send it to the board with our recommendation, this will come in the future, we just want to get things nailed down and such like that. There is a cost. It's going to look like a much higher cost than it's actually going to be. There's a lot of just front numbers coming up. I'm not going to bother giving them out now because there's lots of negotiations, there's lots of things that we work with, different things like that. So that'll all come to the meeting probably March time frame, uh, beginning to the end of March time frame. Can you just uh, clarify the, the numbers, uh, Dr. Shirk, if you can clarify that uh, whatever numbers we're looking at is budgeted for in this year's and next year's budget, correct? Proposed budget. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're working on that piece with the, with the vendors right now to see how we can, uh, you know, make it work with the number this year's numbers and next year's numbers. And uh, uh, if we can't, we'll come back uh, and uh, you know, obviously alert the board and talk to the board about uh, our recommendations to making it making it work. But uh, that's our first the first thing we want to do is to uh, talk to the vendors and basically uh, get an accurate price, if you will. For, for all the different levels uh, on all the different programs and then uh, see how that fits into the budget. And that's coming up shortly. One other piece I forgot, Bill, because I had the note real quick, I forgot to mention it. It was mentioned and I, we didn't have time to just fully discuss it and we'll bring it up probably at a later time. One of the teachers uh, did ask us about uh, the ELA as in, we don't have specific class in, K, in uh, high school for the below level, just the basic academic and the higher, we don't have anything for below. That's been something that we can discuss in the future, of course, but that's, like I said, it's going to be forward. I do have something else for new business that was mentioned, but I'm going to bring me to new business for that. Okay. 
Uh, the policy committee met, uh, I'd say they met tonight, but we also met on the 24th of January, and tonight we would like this, the board to accept the minutes of the policy committee uh, for January 24th, 2017, as submitted. So moved second. Okay, motion and a second to accept the minutes of the policy committee meeting. Any questions there? Rick? No? Okay. okay. No. All right, good. Um, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Yep, to new business. New business? Uh, I had two things. The first thing I wanted to bring up was, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't here at the last meeting, so I didn't get a chance to say, uh, and unfortunately, Mr. Durant has already left for the day, but from uh, speaking with him and many other of our staff that were here, the district duels that we had went off with a unbelievable success, I believe. I think I heard nothing but rave reviews of how the operations was held here, Everything was, everybody left very happy. Uh, as for the public, as in when I said about how we're working on the Booster Club, is working on raising approximately $4,000 to put in a new snack stand. We were halfway there just from that one event, as in we netted uh, over $2,000. Uh, the second thing, actually new business, I was hoping for discussion, was something that was brought up during the curriculum committee uh, that and no one really understands why it stopped. Uh, 50, it was 15 years ago. Uh, as in, to the teachers were wondering just something, they would bring graduates back, and the graduates would be able to either discuss the different things, sort of similar to what Ashley had said at the last meeting about bringing the students back. They would come into class, and they would say the different things of how the education has gone, and how they feel it's prepared them for college. And at the exact same time, though, they were also offering the students to ask them all kinds of questions. They could ask them about, you know, with time management. Uh, obviously, parties is something they usually ask about, but there's a lot of other educational areas they ask about, as to what's life like different than high school up to the college time frame. Uh, that's something that I would like to see if we could actually bring back to Potts Grove. Um, obviously, they used to do it in January. Obviously, January's coming past. That's when the kids were off. Obviously, we know the kids get out early May. And if that's available, or if it has to go back to maybe committee meetings for a future event to discuss during our student affairs portion, I'd be more than well, willing to bring that up as one of our committee, committee subjects. But I wanted to bring that to the board as possible discussion. Um, one of the things I just, sorry, I just wanted to, I think part of the discussion was also that when, if I understood correctly, when the students came back, they were also meeting with the teachers to let them know Correct. what, you know, in their class they liked, what in class helped them or did not help them, so they give feedback to the teachers, so it wasn't just for the students. I'm just going to, I'll just piggyback off that. I would, I would like to see it as, um, you know, a, a culmination of, of you know, sort of gathering information and um, helping and, you know, sort of guiding the future graduates um, and being able to answer questions of the younger kids, but yet at the same time um, help the district sort of, you know, see maybe where they fall short or maybe where they're doing a great job and deserve a pat on the back, something like that. It's just always nice to get feedback from kids who are now out there using the skills they learned here and and can say hey you know this was great you know i'm so happy i started school with this or hey you know this is something that somehow you know was glossed over so i would just really like to see that if possible was this day um, typically like uh, at the end of the school year or the beginning of the school year in january usually in the past that was 15 years ago, so it's. It'd be well, the only the only thing I, I I love the idea, but I would hate to take a, um, a prime instruction time um, away from uh, from the, the students' schedules. Uh, thinking of students who are prepping for an AP exam and uh, and the like. So, you know, would it, maybe it would be possible to bring them in 
in that period of time in between um, our finish and when the students finish college at the end of the year. Also, that would give you a full year's worth of uh, information because they would have finished that first year. So I'm thinking like at the end of May or early June as opposed to January. Can I? Can I, Dr. Mace Coleman, I saw you nodding back there. I was wondering if you may have a chance to answer the question that Mr. Rabinowitz had. If the board feels the directive is wor you know, worthy, I would like to take it back to the curriculum committee and see if we can work something out. I think it's a great idea. Just all right. I have uh, just a quick thing. Uh, I uh, today. Uh, went to the uh, middle school uh, where uh, my son and all the sixth graders uh, participated in the what they what they call the first annual wax museum um, and uh, all the students uh, did uh, uh, extensive uh, research and uh, and a project that included uh, them uh, acting as uh, as a famous individual from History. There were a lot of sports figures. My son was Lou Gehrig. Um, there was a Babe Ruth and uh, a lot of basketball players, Michael Jordan, um, uh, but other people in history like Milton Hershey and uh, and all manner of uh, famous people. It was a nonfiction uh, 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 reading assignment uh, initially, and uh, I just wanted to first of all say that um, that it was uh, the, the students uh, did it. Uh, really impressive jobs, uh, uh, you know, uh, under stress. Uh, you know, their parents were uh, recording them uh, while they were doing their um, their presentations. Uh, um, uh, it was just a really nice hour, um, a little less than an hour spent uh, at at the school. Uh, um, and uh, you know, my son came home very enthused uh, about uh, how his hard work paid off, and I uh, wanted to give a shout out to all the people in the middle school, uh, particularly in the ELA department that, uh, that put this together. Um, I think it's a winner and uh, uh, I have a feeling uh, uh, it will be uh, an annual event from here on. And it was also really nice, uh, I will add, to have uh, so many parents participating uh, and uh, uh, a fast track in and out of the school. It was just very well managed. Um, so uh, uh, kudos to everybody involved. Uh, I just wanted to mention that um, last I think the Tuesday, was it Tuesday was the board luncheon? Yeah. Last Tuesday, yeah, I should remember that. I lost my car keys. <laughs> um, last Tuesday was the um, student board rep luncheon with um, our reps and Spring Ford and Pottstown. And they all came to, and we actually ate right there, right? Was it in that room? They had it closed off. Yeah. Oh, the, the library. Oh, the, okay, okay. Yeah, um, anyway, I, I, it was really, really nice, and I was really proud of Mason and Maya. They did a fantastic job, sort of. Um, they, they were sort of like the, the, the host and co-host 
of the day. They asked lots of questions, and the other reps were very open and um, gave just lots of great information. And I know Springford showed an interest of hosting next year. And um, it was just a really nice, really nice day. Uh, Mr. Dorenzo did a great job planning it, and um, I just felt that, you know, we see Mason and Maya here just, you know, giving their report, and that's about it. But boy, when they were in with their peers, um, you know, we, I saw why they sit there. You know, I saw why they were chosen, because they did a fantastic job, and I was very proud of them. Um, I just want to say that we're definitely going to like go into more detail in terms of what we discuss, but overall it was just a really good experience. Um, we're all on really good terms in terms of um, Springford and Pottstown, and we're even planning to possibly collaborate. So thank you for that opportunity. I just want to kind of say I, I was also in attendance and, and it was blown away by these kids. I mean, you know, I think the intimidation they're having lunch, all but one student kept eating, you know, but they're amongst all the administrators, all the, you know, and they're, they're, they're holding themselves so well, you did such an awesome job. But we talked a little bit about collaboration, how the different school districts uh, could get together, and some of the students are going to get together and help me with the drug task force. Uh, we're going to visit Upper Perk and, um, you know, with the heroin addiction and opiums and things like that. and. All the kids were so excited to jump on board this, um, but but they were just beautiful ladies and gentlemen. They were just awesome. So you did a good job. Thank you, every everyone. Any anything more for new business? So we want to uh, move into uh, answers to previous inquiries. Yes, thank you. Uh, we just wanted to, uh, just to really, the, the, the alumni survey, I uh, just wanted, I know uh, Mrs. Custer, you asked those questions from last meeting, and I think we'll just wrap that, that piece up. But we, we, uh, the, answer, the answer is no, we, we currently don't do anything, uh, but we do have a family connection portal uh, that ha does ask questions, uh, you know, regarding college, work, and military. So uh, that, that can be something we can, we can piggyback on. Um, you know, with uh, with the committee, uh, with the other things, you know, alumni week and the, the gathering of information for our teachers and students. I think that can all be wrapped up in the one package that we, we talked about under student affairs. Uh, with I, that, I just have a quick question on that. Um, one of the things that has been on my mind, and I keep forgetting to bring up, and it comes down to like the alumni, um, is if we not had a, a scheduled date for the open house yet, because I think that would be a perfect opportunity to invite alumni um, to come back. So, you know, we have this beautiful school and I haven't heard anything about an open house, so I just wonder where we stand on that. Great, great question. Uh, you have no, no, we don't, actually, because, you know, Mr. Nestor and I is, you know, with tongue in cheek have tried, we, 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 would, we started this process back in the fall with our contractors to try to come up with, we came up with several dates, uh, late fall, before the holiday, and um, that's one of the reasons why we're still talking about this after an, an executive session about potential litigation. So we just didn't have the building where we wanted it to to open up, you know, for for public. So um, as soon as we feel we're getting closer, but I think we have a couple more hurdles. So uh, once we do, we'll we'll make that that grand entrance and have a, the river cutting. Absolutely. Uh, the next uh, question, I, I had an opportunity to share uh, information with the board regarding substitute information. I really just wanted to share that information with the public tonight. Uh, it's really, you know, in response to uh, uh, the district's uh, substitute shortage, and uh, I'd compiled much information, you know, for the board. I just really put it put it back out. We're still in the process of, of uh, gathering some information as well, uh, you know, as far as uh, that piece is concerned. Uh, I'm looking for a little direction from the board uh, if they want more specific information uh, regarding regarding this. Uh, I have uh, explored several other you know several other uh, pieces to this uh, regarding um, uh, 
ways we spend money currently for helping our, our, our current colleagues out when, we, when teachers uh, take extra uh, students on in the classrooms uh, or teachers cover during preps. We have some information there. So, uh, and we also continue to look at teacher attendance uh, as a big factor in why, we, why at times we don't have coverage. So um, I just wanted to, uh, before I moved really any further, I was just looking for some direction for the board if you want me to continue to dive into this. Um, but I, um, I think that we do at this point do our due diligence uh, when it comes to uh, you know, going to uh, different functions, job fairs, uh, interviewing people throughout the year. And what happens is at times the, the turnover is such that we, we hire someone in a substitute role and then all of a sudden they're put in a permanent role and uh, it depletes our, our sub, uh, our sub uh, you know, piece. So um, there's, there's if I, again, I'm looking for direction. If the board would like me to go a little bit deeper, some of those, some of those things would be salary, that was mentioned before, uh, what that would cost, uh, salary with other different employee groups. So uh, I just wanted to know, because it'll, be, it'll, it'll take some time. Uh, we, can, we have the data, but I just was looking for a little direction if the board wanted me to explore more, more information regarding substitute. This came up because I brought this up last meeting, two weeks ago, I guess. Um, when we look at the numbers, and yes, I agree we're comparable, compatible to other districts, um, but I think we need to look at those numbers a little deeper uh, as far as what we're compensating the subs, because like all districts, we're having sub failures, absolutely, but of course the school board and administration is focused on what's best for our students. Um, and when a, 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 there is a sub failure, uh, it, it has such a negative impact on so many. Of course, those students, uh, then they get split up and then it affects other classes. Um, but we're compensating our subs while comparable to other districts, yes, when you look at, uh, when you calculate that out to what that would be annually, and you look at what we compensate a central office um, uh, person for a day-to-day -day, uh, types contract situation to what that equals out to annually, there's a huge difference. Um, I think paying $100 a day, uh, 110, then 120, that equals, I didn't bring my numbers with me, but 20-something thousand a year, um, I, I think that should say to us, we really need to look at this, especially with the negative um, uh, impact it has on the students. You know, what can we do? You, the administration has done a fantastic job in, in really doing, I mean, what more can the administration do? I think we need to look at uh, the salaries. I had emailed, uh, email February 18th, and I, I guess we're looking for, for, I don't know why, but I guess we need board permission. I. I you know, if anybody has uh, a problem uh, with the questions I asked, then please please state that uh, here publicly. But the questions I had asked that I would like feedback on is what did we pay last year in compensation to teachers for having extra kids in their room due to a sub failure? Um, will we, and, you know, if we go with my proposal as far as compensating subs more appropriately, um, it's going to cost us, but it also save in a sense. I don't think we're going to. Um, save as much as we spend, uh, but there, how often was there a sub failure? We need to see the, really how big is this impact, um, you know, uh, been having on our students, and how many days did we need at least one sub? And the reason why I asked that was some districts are going to having um, a full-time sub on to be put wherever. Um, and would that be cost effective? I'm not proposing that, I don't know. You know, if it would be cost effective, great. If not, then, then no. But um, I, I don't see um, any negative, I don't see any reason why any of those questions couldn't have been or can't be answered. If anybody disagrees from the board, please speak up so we can't give the administration direction. So, I'll say, uh, you know, first of all, what we try to do is we try to limit the requests for, for work uh, from the administration uh, to a certain amount of uh, time that they put in. 
regarding individual requests. Um, if we want them to put in more time, then we seek for it to be the will of the board, and we seek for it to be discussed in public forum in order to give them that direction. That said, it's my personal opinion that uh, going after the salary issue shouldn't be the number one priority to try to address this problem. I know that I asked before uh, in the board meeting when we talked about this the first time for us to better understand how we compare to uh, other districts that are in drivable distance from us. I know personally, uh, you know, this is just me, looking at a road like 422, an extra five, 10, $15 a day isn't really going to get me to drive two more exits down, down a crowded 422 uh, when I have the option to, to work someplace closer to home for, for that amount of money. It would just be interesting. I think it would be valuable information for us to understand how do we compare with the other districts in driving distance. Another thing that I think Bill touched on, but I don't know where it went, was uh, the absenteeism trends uh, in our regular full-time teachers. Are they up? Are more teachers taking sick days? What's causing us to have this shortage? Um, and instead of just, and you know, I'm not a proponent of throwing any solution at a problem until we do a proper root cause analysis, but especially when it comes to money, I, I wouldn't be a, a supporter of throwing money at a problem before we know what the root cause is. So my, my interest, and again, I'm just one, is to get, you know, if we want to pursue this, and there's two things, right? Are we, are we in the same situation as every other district and we can't do anything about it other than offer to pay more? Or are we in a worse scenario? Um, and to, to understand that, if it's gotten worse over the years, why? And, and what can we do about it? But I think that's, you know, I think that's something that takes time. And I do think that we gave the direction to the administration to go back and find those things for us. Um, and continue to report back. I, I agree that there's a problem. I just like to know where the problem's coming from before uh, before I agree on how to attack it. That's just me personally. Well, I, I think I was pretty clear on that. So, do you disagree with the questions I asked the administration, or can we, uh, as a board, say these are questions we like looked into so we can, as you said, you know, make a objective decision? I disagree with with the. I disagree with us getting involved in having the administration go back and look into it in however way they see fit for, for a first time around. Because if we have nine different people asking nine different sets of questions, some based on money, some based on ab absenteeism, then we're, then we're, we're, we're breaking up their, their flow. So my personal preference would be to have them have a go at it and, and see where, where it gets us. That's, that's well, and we did multiple times, and they brought that in from rightfully, you know, adequately i mean they yeah. brought that information right i don't know last year and then just now so right. um they they have done that they have done a great job with that uh and i would like to see a little more information specifically what are we spending on compensation um and i agree with you too if it's if this is something that's not captured it takes weeks and weeks well that's a different story uh it seems to me it would be captured but i don't know the counting system uh, that well and how often was there sub failure again the fact that asap is done electronically it seems to me but could be wrong that this would be uh, something that's already captured and easy to find if it's not I, I'm, I'm all with you but if it's a simple uh answer you know that can be found easy i don't see why we're automatically judging that my questions are, are going to take weeks at a time I think the specific questions that you asked are fine, but they're not going to, by themselves, give us a complete idea of what's going on. In other words, you know, when we talk about teacher absenteeism, are they clustered around holidays or weekends? Um, and are, are, do we have five sub failures on a Friday before a long weekend? When it's 70 degrees. When it's 70 degrees outside. <laughs> um, so your questions didn't ask that. You just asked how many failures do we have? You've also got to ask when they are and what, are, what is the cause of it. Then ask. I'm so just, let's not just ask my questions, then ask the questions. I'm saying, please, administrators, look into this and tell us what we can do and what the issues are that are causing this and what we can do about it. That's how I'd like to handle it. 
I'd like to go circle back to the discussion we had at the last meeting in which uh, I think if you're going to look at this, to your point, Dr. Sherp, um, the issue of substitute teachers is just one uh, and their compensation and frankly, in my opinion, uh, a lesser issue uh, uh, than, uh, than the compensation for other substitutes uh, in the district or, um, uh, you know, uh, whose pay has not moved in many, many years. Uh, and, uh, and while, you know, I actually uh, uh, brought this up uh, with uh, Mrs. Viola last year asking mm -hmm. if raising our rates might impact these, uh, well, I guess your term you're using is sub failures. Does that mean uh, uh, there's no sub for a class? Um, then, um, um, you know, uh, uh, the data that I got back led me to believe that probably not without uh, a significant raise in pay. Um, and as I expressed last time, I'm 100% opposed to a large increase in pay for substitute teachers. I do not want to be at the front of that train um, for uh, a variety of reasons. I, I recognize that our subs work uh, very hard and uh, um, and they are certified teachers who do uh, important work, but a uh, but if we we're at the front of the train, then everybody else is just going to follow us, and we'll just be in the same uh, uh, shape that we're in currently. So, if we need to uh, adjust, great. But uh, but I want that to be a very measured and considered uh, a bit of work uh, from the uh, administration. From my preference. Would be that you look at the that our uh, look at our rates for all of our subs relative to the rates that other districts are charging, um, and and the fair market too, and um, and with with an eye towards where the larger problem is, which they've done multiple times, yeah. including this right. last. No, they haven't because they haven't raised the price of uh, substitute. Uh, 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 Custodians and, uh, no, uh, and, and teachers' aides in seven years. Well, my concern wasn't uh, didn't start with, and I'm not trying to ridicule. Uh, my concern didn't. I didn't come in with the concern of our poor substitutes can't make a living. My concern came in with, uh, which could be, probably is an issue, but my main concern came from our students. So if there's something that we can do, such as compensate, so we're not equivalent to all of the districts. So like Matt says, you know, why would I go an extra five miles or, you know, you know, go down 422 or whatever when I can get paid, you know, five, ten dollars. I mean, who's going to change for that, right? Um, so my, I, my concern isn't with the staff substitutes as much as it is for the students. Having no teacher in a room for a whole day, I, if, I, I don't know, I, if some people think that's not an issue, but uh, that's quite a problem for our students and other students that get affected by it. So why don't we just look at the numbers and not be afraid to look at the numbers and see what it would do if you have this many subs for you know the area, not just us, and all the districts are, you know, taking from this small pile, this small group. Well, where's this small? Somebody's going to have a cell failure. Our concern can't be with all the districts, right? Or at least not our main concern. Our main concern needs to be our students. And if we can, if an issue, if something would help, such as uh, not overinflated, right? Not not paying them like why would I ever stop being a sub, right? But paying them more adequate and compared to other districts. Why not look at that? Just look. I'm not saying do it, but we have looked, and we are paying adequate compared to other districts. And and if you significantly raise your rates above what other districts are paying, then they're just going to follow suit, and we'll be in no better shape if, um, on behalf of the students that you're talking about. <coughs> That's my opinion. If I can just say something here, um, obviously the biggest problem that we have here with subs is that there aren't enough. Period. We can't generate more subs. We, we can't pull them out of thin air. Okay, so I think asking the administration to do backflips and do all kinds of extra work when it comes down to 
they're just not there to be hired, I, I think that's wasting their time. And I would, ha I would really like to see them work on other things that, that maybe they can solve. <coughs> I mean, right now, it seems to me that they're doing everything that they can to get as many subs in here as possible. And to ask them to keep on giving us more and more information about it, I, I think is a waste of time. Because if the, if the employees aren't out there to be hired, then we can't hire them. And right now, they're not out there to be hired. There's a minimal amount of teachers graduating right now. and. Um, that just reduces the amount of subs we have. So, um, if everybody paid peanuts, because like you say, it's a small pool compared to what you know is needed. If everybody paid peanuts and a district said, you know what, we're going to take the lead. We're going to stop paying peanuts. We're going to start paying half of what they should be getting. Is that not worth looking at? I agree with you that if we paid more, we would attract more. But the very second we start to pay more, then Boyertown's going to pay more, and, and right. Owen J. And, and, and I'm sorry, Bill, but you need to step back from this. You are a substitute teacher, so you need to step away from this. I, I from sub this as because, pleasure. Right, not, got, I'm not going to get compensated but, differently from here. Sure, I'll you abstain sure, from the you vote sure would if necessary. If, if the other schools step forward and, and follow All right. our suit. You I would, take offense so by that comment. I'm going to put it on the record. I'm making a motion, and everybody's opinion can be on the record, okay? I make a motion that we send to the administration the following questions, two questions. If anybody wants to add questions, so be it, but I want it on the record. I make a motion that we ask the administration, what do we pay last year in compensation to teachers for having extra kids in their room due to a sub failure? Number two, how often was there a sub failure? That's my motion. Is there a second for Bill's motion? Motion and table. Second. No second. No second. No second. No second. No second. Yeah. You can't table until it's second. Okay. Yeah. I'll second Bill's motion. No motion and table. I'll second that too. <laughs> So we have a motion to table. All in, uh, any questions or comments? Discussion on a motion to table by Member Marx. There's no, there's no okay. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is tabled. Next item. The next uh, question was regarding uh, the uh, SPP, and I just wanted to bring to the board's attention that um, yeah, this is brought at the February 14th board meeting to ask about the update for 1670 SPP results. To date, we've received nothing from the Department of Education. So we're waiting to hear from that. And then also fr uh, from, uh, from the previous meeting, we, uh, we had questions regarding security camera, and uh, I know uh, Mr. Carwell, has worked on the issues with our school resource officers, uh, developing uh, ready responders uh, regarding our cameras and any other emergencies that might occur. And uh, he uh, basically has put that uh, in writing for you. Uh, also, the vendor has, has resolved all of our issues. So I think the key things there in the paragraphs that he has submitted for us for tonight and for the public are that um, our school resource officers are involved. Uh, he is putting together a, a group of responders to assist if there is a need uh, for uh, repair and that our vendor has uh, stepped to the plate to make sure that all the identified issues at the high school uh, and at the middle school, is that correct, Mr. Carwell? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, are, have been taken care of uh, at this time. Okay, we're moving on to our second spot for public comment. Do we have any public comment on uh, non-agenda items that came up tonight? Okay. Uh, so at this, this time we'll, uh, we'll adjourn the meeting and move into executive session. Thanks, everyone.